good morning and happy new year from here at Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church our pastor is none other than Pastor C.J. Ross and we begin a new year this year and we begin a new year it's a new year of new beginnings a time to renew your fellowship with the Lord and it's just a time of our lesson is this morning, Blessing of Reconciliation. Before we get started, I'll read the text. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we bow our heads in prayer this morning. Father God, first of all, giving you honor, glory, and thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love, Father God. And we are gathered here this morning, and we say once again, thank you. Father, as we go into our lesson, we pray that you open up our hearts and minds. Give us patience and understanding of your word, that we may apply it unto our lives to make us better stewards for you. We ask now, Father, that you just be in the midst, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I said the, bless, the title of the lesson is Blessing of Reconciliation. And here Paul is, has um, having a problem in the church that he's having some naysayers. And anytime we try to work for God and we do for God, you're always going to have those that are naysayers. All you need is just a few to get behind you, and you can start up something. So Paul was dealing with this within the church, and we're going to take a look at it this morning. Knowing our lesson comes from the book of Corinthians, the Second Corinthians, chapter five, starting at verse eleven. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men but we are made manifest unto God. And our trust also made manifest in your conscience. The first uh, verse, fearing the Lord. And in this it verse, it's talking about a fear of God, but it's also talking about a healthy you're scared or terrified of God but you fear his wrath when you know that you have done wrong and it's almost like you know when we were when I was growing up I loved my mother and father but I had a fear of the punishment that I would receive when I done wrong and that's the kind of fear that I'm explaining here it's a healthy fear Paul sought to persuade men concerning the coming judgment of his own integrity as a minister he, uh, of the need of reconciliation. It seemed to be immediate and relevant. And verse, tw verse 12, for we recommend for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat the answer, the answer to them which glory in appearance and not in heart. While Paul's opponents might have been questioning his sincerity, he questioned the hearts of those who were concerned only with outward appearance. If as if, as some suggest, these teachers were judges seekers, we know that they were particularly concerned with outward ritual acts. And you know how we say, you know, it's, we don't come for form or fashion. We come to serve the Lord. But here it's describing as the judiciary, 
Jude sayers as people who were focusing more on how they appear to be holy. But Paul says you got to have it within your heart. And he explains to them it's not on the outward appearance, it's what you have inside that makes you uh, one with Christ. In verse 13, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. To be beside oneself was to be insane, apparently, was to be insane. Apparently, an accusation that some had leveled, leveled at the Apostle Paul, if in his zeal, the Apostle seemed to be out of his mind. It was for the glory of God. On the other hand, if Paul seemed too serious, it had the benefit of blessing the Corinthians. This would not be the last time Paul would be accused of being insane. Paul was very serious about his worship and his prayer. And, you know, we hear some of that today. Oh, it don't take all of that. But Paul says, that's just how serious my worship is. You know, it may look like I'm going insane, but I'm doing it for, the, for God showing you how much that I love him. And that's the way we should be. You know, sometimes we sit quiet, but sometimes you just got to get up out your seat. You got to stomp your feet. You got to show God that you, you shout for his glory. You know, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's the way we should be. You know, we, we hear some that say it don't take all that, but sometimes it does. 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that, that if one died for all, then we then we then were all dead. The real reason Paul served the Lord was to love was the love of Christ. The word constraineth can be translated controlled or compelled, thus indicating that Christ's love was the primary motivation for Paul's ministry. Christ's love will keep any believer, Christ's love will keep any believer from, uh, Christ's love will keep any believer in promises and streams Paul's judgment made once for all at his conversion. This one died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, in one died for all. It seems kind of confusing when you read it back and forth, but Jesus died for us all. And when we serve him, we die in our old self. And we put on the new. So, uh, you know, in a sense, we died to the old man and became new once we, uh, once we knew we came to serve Christ. We put off the old and bring on the new. We're at verse 15. that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Those who have been redeemed by the one for their sake died and rose again, should wholly live for the Lord, and not self. And all died identifies the believer with Christ. And uh, as I said before, 14 and 15 sort of go together. You know, we, 
Christ died for us. So we should try to put off our sin and die that old man in us, that old person in us should die off and we become true believers of Christ. In verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, thought have known, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know him no more. To know someone after the flesh might indicate looking at someone purely or, or from a worldly standpoint. As a Pharisee, Paul rightly viewed both people and positions in such manner, having come to know the Lord. However, he gained a new perspective. He wanted to see people as Christ saw him, saw them. As Jesus was willing to divest himself of great privilege to come to earth, so believers must share a similar attitude. Paul's statement, we have known Christ after the flesh, have led some to conclude that Paul had a personal knowledge of his acquaintance with Jesus of Nazareth. Paul knew Jesus as a, as in flesh as a believer. But in his conversion, he knew Christ as our Lord and King. He knew then that, that Christ was not a man. He was our Lord. He was the Son of God. In verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things The expression in Christ is a favorite of the Apostle Paul. It denotes our union with Christ and our incorporation into his spiritual body. To be in Christ is to be a Christian. It is to be changed by his power into, into a completely new person. So great is the change that Christ makes, makes that Paul could describe it as becoming a new creature. In verse 17, the believer now becomes a new creature and old ways are passed away. Shows change or regeneration when we become true believers. When we become true believers in Christ, there should be a regeneration there, a, a, a new infill all the things that we know that we did in the world, we put those away. We cast those off and we put on a new, a new creature. We become new creatures in Christ. Verse 18. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Having been reconciled to Christ, Paul was given the ministry of reconciliation. The change from the old to the new was in fact the work of God. Salvation is of the Lord from start to finish. Reconciliation. Both acts belong to God. Reconciliation precedes donation to sinners and they are reconciled by the death of Christ died for our sins. He reconciled. He reconciled for us by his death. And he rose again so that we may know him as the Son of God. Verse 19. Having been reconciled to Christ, Paul was given the ministry of reconciliation. The change from the old to the new was, in fact, the work of God. Salvation is of the Lord from start to finish. In verse 20, 
verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As true God did beseech you by us, we pray. You in Christ, Steve, be ye reconciled to God. An ambassador has a dual role. He is a messenger and a representative. In actuality, he has no authority of his own. His authority derives from the one who sent him. In this case, Paul viewed himself as an ambassador for Christ. And as we, as we are followers of Christ, we are also ambassadors. We, we should represent Christ everywhere she, we go and, and, and tell of his good works and tell of the good news. Let everyone know that we are followers of Christ. We are his ambassadors. We, we teach, we show, and we let our light shine of the good news. In verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin we might be made the righteous of God in him. As the Holy Son of God, Jesus Christ knew no sin. This was in spite of the fact that he was in all points tempted as we are, that he never succumbed to the allurement of the devil, uniquely qualified him to be our Savior, the one who was wounded for our transgression bruised for our iniquities, that God made him to be sin for us means that Christ became a sin offering on our behalf. Mm. This should not be taken to mean that Jesus became a real sinner. Rather, he took the place of sinners on the cross, a sub, sub to, subtunary atonement made possible our righteousness and thus our right standing before God. This is not based on what we have done, but on what he has done. Very wonderful lesson this morning and a time for reconciliation if you're having trouble and, and for all of us to check ourselves and let, us know, and let God know that we love him and we are his ambassadors. Tell of the good news everywhere we go. So, hope that everyone got something out of the lesson. And thank you. And have we let us pray that we have a wonderful new year. 22 was good, but let's make 23 even better. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Deacon Patterson, for today's Sunday School lesson, Blessings of Reconciliation. These are our morning announcements. Please join us for in-person Bible study every Wednesday night from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. All ministries are asked to please submit the names of your officers for the 2023 calendar year to Sister Barbara McCoy. Can you please submit those today? The Golden Delights Ministry will sponsor their very first prayer breakfast on Saturday, January the 7th at 8 a.m. The guest speaker will be our, our very own Minister Caroline McMillan. Everyone is invited to attend. The CE Ministry will be offering the Veterans Service Workshop on Saturday, also Jan January the 7th at 10 o'clock a.m. If you are a veteran, spouse of a veteran, a child of a veteran, you are encouraged to attend. To attend, Learn some of the benefits offer, afforded to veterans. Trustee Harold Johnson and various speakers will be presenting. Our January announcer for the second su Sunday, Sister Terry Rozier. The worship through instruction, the Sunday school lesson for next Sunday, titled Blessing of Forgiveness and New Life, will be by our very own Deaconess Tara Rozier. Our prayer, prayer breakfast, January the 7th, Veterans Workshop, January the 7th, 8 and 10, 
Our church conference will be here at Cedar Grove on 6 to 7 on January the 20th, 6 to 7 p.m. Remember our sick and shut in and those requesting prayer. Please join us this morning for our, work, for our morning worship service at 11 a.m. here at Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church or via Facebook Live. On behalf of our pastor, Reverend C.J. Ross, our First Lady, Felicia Ross, we would like to wish everyone a happy, blessed, and prosperous new year.